Hello everyone, uh, sorry for the angle of the camera. Um, I'm very purpley today, I don't know if you can see. You know, purple is my favorite color. So we are going to read about women in art. And um, as you may or may not know, I'm an artist. I do a lot of things, but I like to describe myself as an artist. Born and raised artist. Um, so, as usual, I'm not going to go through, let me put the camera up because there's really no point of you looking at my shirt. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole book because, you know, uh, you have to support the artist, the creator. Um, and if you like it, I'd say you buy it, you know? Um, and if you don't have money, that's fine, you know, you don't have to buy it. There's always time. So, let's see who we get. I'm just going to randomly flip the pages. Oh, look, isn't that funny? We got purple. And let me read her name. <laughs> Tamara de Lempica. She was a painter. All right, so Tamara Lempica. Ooh, she was an American painter. Oh, no, 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 no. No, she's Russian. All right, so let's look at the imagery. Um, very interesting. Twenties. 18, maybe. I, I'm very bad with time, timeline. Um, it reminds me of um, that movie with the flappers. But yeah, so let me, let's read about her. I am going to start with the left page. And it says here, <laughs> it was funny. Painted nudes and the glitzy elite during the roaring 20s. I knew I was right. Come on. During the roaring 20s, okay. I knew what I was talking about. The quintessential artist of the Art Deco area era, <coughs> excuse me, combined cubism with neoclassical style to create highly stylized and polished paintings. And this is her quote: um, "I live life in the margins of society, and the rules of the normal society don't apply to those who live on the fringe." Yeah. I live on the fringe, I don't live in society. Well, I live with society, but I don't know. Whatever. So, Tamara de Lampica, painter, 1898-1980s. Tamara de Lampica was born in 19, 1898, sorry, my dyslexia, in War Warsaw in what was then part of the Russian Empire. Oof, that's tough. Her family was very wealthy, but all that would change during Russia's violent revolution in 1917. Mm. Her family fled, but Tamara and her husband, Tazus Lempiki, oh god, I can't say his name, Tazus Lempiki, refused to leave St. Petersburg. Soon, Tazus was taken by the police, and Tamara had to negotiate his safe return from prison. They soon immigrated to Paris. Ah, bon, trouble, petty. Tazus be became too depressed to work. Ooh. And Tamara gave birth to their daughter. Faced with poverty, Tamara decided that she would provide for her family by using her natural talent for painting. That is crazy. And very interesting. Tamara began her art studies at the Académie de la Grande Chamille in 1918. In 1925, her paintings had been accepted into major art shows in Milan and Paris. Girl, that's great. And she was getting attention from magazines such as Harper's Bazaar. I've never heard of that. I'm going to look it up. Tomorrow's art was born from the glamorous world of the 1920s. Yeah, 1920s. Pretty crazy. Like the Art Deco designs and buildings of the era, her paintings were smoothly polished, highly decorated, and, above all, celebrated new technology and wealth. That's awesome. See, you can be an artist and you can be involved in everything. She painted beautiful models and the ultra-rich elite upper class of Europe and the United States. So she was involved here too. Her subjects would often stand towering over a backdrop of skyscrapers, exuding power. Tamara's work became hugely popular and her main patron was the wealthy Dr. Pierre Bocard, which with him... As a client, Tamara became wealthy herself. 
She purchased a custom designed house through extravagant parties, of course, because she's from, she's like the 20s, the 1920s, and wore the finest jewels and furs. Just as she created scenes of lavishness in her paintings, Tamara made sure her public persona fit in this era of decadence. Mm. Which is ironic because she was talking about living on the fringe. Um, just as she created scenes of lavishness in her paintings, Tamara made sure her public persona fit. Oh, sorry, I read that already. Mm. In 1928, Tezus and Tamara divorced, and in 1934, she remarried Baron Raul Kufner. In 1939, Tamara took a trip to the... Sorry, my roommate is talking. <laughs> in 1939, Tamara took a trip to visit friends in Germany. Tamara was half Jewish. Oh, girl, you're half Jewish? Woo! And she was just uh, disturbed by the anti-Semitism she saw and how different Germany was under the Nazis. She convinced her husband that they needed to leave Europe and move to the United States. Tamara continued to paint, but her art career began to fade into obscurity. Wow, that sucks. That really, that's sad. She was rediscovered, and in 1973, the Luxembourg Gallery in Paris held a retrospective of her work. Her Art Deco paintings were a roaring success. She passed away in 1980. Today, her paintings are still collected by posh people and celebrities. Oh, God. All the posh people have your paintings. Oh, well. You can look it up on the internet and find her art for free. Um, I'm not saying steal art. I'm just saying be smart. Let's see what else is included. There's little designs. So it says... Has heavily influenced by her mentor, Andre Lott, I believe that's how you say his name, who painted in the synthetic cubist style. That's an interesting style. I've never seen it. I might have seen it, but I don't recognize it. And she has a, there's an example of one of her paintings, so I won't talk about that. Madonna featured Tamara's paintings in many of her music videos. Oh, I didn't know that. Huh. I'm actually going to look up some Madonna videos after this then. Claimed that she would paint for nine hours at a time, only stopping for champagne, a massage, and a bath. Sounds like me. Um, I don't paint for nine hours, though. Uh, I work for nine hours or more. And then I go take a bath and get a massage. There's another portrait. She was openly bisexual and painted gay public figures like Duchess de la Salle and André Guide. Oh, so she was bisexual. Isn't that interesting? All right, so let's look at it again. Isn't that nice? Purple, my favorite color. 1920s. Uh, very nice. Let's see who's next. Oh, snap. All right, so Sukati Douglas Camp, and she was a sculptor. Sculpting is fun. I love sculpting. So look at her art, look at her drawings. Ooh, sorry, I need a better camera. Starting from the left. <coughs> Creates art that celebrates Nigerian people. I love that. Weld steel to create her intricate sculptures. Ooh, she just, she's a welder. That is tough. That's high, high heat. I haven't been able to do welding, but one day I will. She promotes political awareness about her environmental issues, which is awesome. I love that. Um, <clears throat> I'm very, uh, my art is very political. Uh, and I'm not going to show any of my art unless you guys request it. But um, I think art is a great tool, you know, to be political, to show your voice. If it's political to realize you have a voice, oh, well, here we go, then I guess I have always been political. Mm -hmm. I was born political. Sakari Douglas Camp. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Sakari Douglas Camp, sculpture, 1958. And apparently she's still alive. What? Ooh, girl. All right. Sculptor Sakari Douglas Camp absolutely loves working in steel. Through welding, Sakari has transformed metal, metal into delicate flowers. Patterned fabric a dancing woman, and even a life-size bus. With this strong material, she creates beautiful, permanent pieces of art. 
Sokari was born in Beguma, Nigeria, in 1958. She was raised by her brother-in-law, an anthropologist whose family was in the arts. Cool. He gave Sokari her very first painting set. At the age of eight, she began attending boarding school in England. She then studied at Central School of Art and Design in London and received a Master's of Arts degree from the Royal College of Art in 1986. After completing her studies, Sokari returned to Nigeria, where she met her husband, architect Alan Camp. He sounds familiar. I think I've heard of him. Together, they moved back to England. Sokari's sculpture work is inspired both by her time in the UK and by the strength, fashion, and spirit of the Nigerian people. Her sculpture figures are often dressed in traditional Nigerian clothing with decorative, decorative patterns and bright colors, all made of metal. Over the course of her career, she exhibited all over the world. In 2012, wow, 2012, Sokati created the sculpture called All the World is Now. All the World is Now Richer, sorry. To uh, commemorate, oh god, I'm gonna have trouble with this word. Commemorate the abolition of slavery. She was inspired by former, former slave William Prescott, who in 1937 wrote, they will, they will remember that we were sold, but they won't remember that we were strong. They will remember that we were brought, but not that we were brave. But not that we were brave. Very interesting. I love that quote. It's actually really emotional for me. So Kati created six sculptures, figures, each dressed in the clothing of different time periods, representing the history before and after emancipation. This powerful piece of art has been slowly publicly at many locations, including the House of Commons in London. Excuse me, I have to drink water because this is, this is intense. I know I have a Flanagan's cup. I reuse plastic, I'm sorry. She wants to especially bring attention to the pollution of the Ni Niger Delta in Nigeria. In response, Sakari has created many art pieces that use recycled or oil barrels barrels, such as the sculpture Greenleaf Barrel 2014. Today, Sakati can be found in her home studio in London with a blowtorch in one hand, metal in the other, creating beautiful works of art and focus on issues she cares about. Wow. So she's still creating art and her art is very important to um, society, not only to people of Nigeria, but everyone because environmental environmentalism is about our earth our planet and if you don't care about where we live um you know we're gonna have issues like we're having now we are having those issues because people did not care about the environment they used it and they abused it and now this is the result of what is a product of neglect pretty much and ignorance so yes yeah, she's an artist she's alive I say contact her, you know, uh, if you're a little kid, if you're an adult, you're interested, send her an email, like, I'm sure you can find her and talk to her, come on, like, she's alive, oh, we almost forgot, we have, we got to look at the little pictures, uh, works such as the Blind Love and Grace 2016 reference classic western paintings, but feature Nigerian figures in traditional garments, I love that, so, um, the reason why I love that is because, um, I don't know how it is in other countries. I haven't had the opportunity to travel. Um, but in America, all our public figures are white. And, except for MLK, Martin Luther King, and Rosa Parks, and a few others, Pocahontas, and another Native American. But uh, our public figures are white, like, and they're white males. It's really quite boring, you know, Ugh, so boring. So um, I'm glad that she's doing that, and I think a lot of people should do that. That would be a great art project. Get your standard figure, your icons, your role models, and change their gender, change their ethnicity for fun. You know, it's art. It There's nothing wrong with art. You cannot go wrong with art. Okay, she has a quote here. 
I have a dream that the Niger Delta will be cured even though it is dying of oil pollution. Sakari so Douglas Camp, it will be cured. Um, I totally believe in that. All pollution is going to be fixed in the coming years. And um, I believe you children are going to help with that. So let's see what else. She has a battle bus. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and it says, I accuse the oil companies of on the bus. So Battle Bus, Living Memorial for Ken Sadowaiwa, 2006, is a life-size sculpted bus named for the re respected eco-activist. Oh, so he he was an eco-activist, Ken, Sad Ken Sadowaiwa. Eco-activist. Cool. Great. All right. Her work in is her work is in, in collections at the Smithsonian Museum. Mm, let's go to the Smithsonian <laughs> Smithsonian Museum. Ooh, it's in Tokyo. I am gonna go to Japan eventually. Tokyo Setagaya Art Museum. I will go there. And the British Museum. Very plain name. British Museum. All right, let's choose somebody else. I'm only going to do three. Actually, you know, I'll do more than three because I love this book. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, okay, so it seems like we have the next person on the next page. And it's Maya Lin. And I assume she is Chinese. Oh, no, she's American Chinese. All right, so she's green. Green's a nice color, you know. And um, green is like pretty calming. Makes me sleepy. All right, left side. Her work focuses on history, science, civil rights, and environmentalism. We have another environmentalism, and we have a civil rights activist. Awesome. And she's an artist. Look at that. Won the Na National Medal for of Arts, the na the nation's highest honor for artistic excellence in two thousand nine. Wow, I didn't know there was. An honor for arts. Designed the Viet oh she's Vietnamese descent. Vietnam designed the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. The Civil Rights Memorial in Alabama and the Women's Table at Yale University. Wow, look at that. That is amazing. I work with a lot of veterans, you know, and I I, I think that's great. I try to give people a different way of looking at their surroundings. That's art to me, and I agree with that. Maya Lin, that's her quote. Maya Lin, architect, sculptor, and designer, 1959, and she's still alive. Wow, awesome. Maya Lin was born in 1959 in Athens, Ohio. She created from an academic, oh, she came, sorry. She came from an academic family and began her studies in architecture at Yale University. In 1981, there was a national-wide call for entries to design the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. The Vietnam War had been very unpopular in the United States. Yes, it was. And hundreds of thousands of young men had been drafted to fight overseas. <sighs> <coughs> The war ended in 1975 when the United States withdrew from Vietnam defeat. In 1981, the war was still controversial, and it's still controversial, to be honest. We still don't like it. Maya entered the competition with her design of a simple V-shaped, reflective black stone, a stone wall that would sink into the earth. Wow, that's actually really smart. I like that. On the wall would be the names of every fallen soldier. She wanted to create a space where each visitor could reflect upon and remember the war in their own personal way. At the age of 21, while still a college student, Maya won the competition. She was 21 years old. That's very young. When it was announced that Maya had designed the winning piece, there was an uproar. Oh, girl, I know. I knew it. Her Asian heritage was met with racial slurs from politicians and the press. Wow. Her Asian heritage was met with racial slurs from politicians and press. I'm not going to say anything about that. 
Some politicians criticized its unique design, wanting a more traditional monument. How boring. How blase. That's the word of the day. Blase. And I believe it's French. Mm -mm -mm. They proposed painting the memorial white and placing an eight-foot statue and flag on top of it. Oh, my God. I'm sorry, that is too funny. That is so blase. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> Maya defended her design in front of Congress. Mm. And a room full of reporters and her original this original design was built. I'm glad she did that. I'm glad she stood up for her art. Since 1982, millions of people have been visit, visited the memorial to mourn and remember. It is now widely be beloved. See? The Vietnam Veterans Memorial was just the start of Maya's career. She has created sculptures inspired by the Native American burial mounds she was growing up in, up in, in Ohio. I am also very interested in Native American culture. Um, I am part Native American, um, only 25%. It's not a big deal, but I highly respect I highly respect them. Any indigenous person, really. Da -da 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 -da. Let's see where we stop. Her wave field series features landscapes sculpted into ocean like waves. For many buildings, such as the Weber House, 1991, 1993. I was born in 1991, and my sister was born in 1993. How interesting. And the Langston Huge Library, 1999, were created in response to the landscape around them. In all her work, Maya is committed to using sustainable materials and limiting the negative impact on the environment. Maya has also designed many memorials that mark complicated moments in history. She created the Civil Rights Memorial in 1989 in Alabama. That is a tough place. And the Woman's Table at the Yale University in 1993. I don't... I want to go see it, actually. I think I, I'm going to go visit that. I'm curious to see what that's about. Maya Lin's work is not just architecture or just sculpture. Instead, it's something powerful that does both today. Does both. Today, she continues to push the boundaries of art and design. So if you like Maya, send her an email. Send her a letter. Send her art. I'm sure she'll love it. Um, I love this whole book, and I really like Maya. She's, she's a tough lady. And I hope she is... Um, it doesn't mention her... Her background, it just says Maya Lin. I'm assuming because she did the Vietnam piece, she's her family's from Vietnam. But if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, please correct me. All right, let's see. In 2016, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. She got the Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the U.S. Wow, that is awesome. And then there's a little picture of two women, and it says that's a lot of zeros. The Women's Table at Yale lists the number of women who have attended Yale since its founding in 1701. Oh. Starting with a long string of zeros. Oh, oh I'm definitely going to see this. Making each year no women were allowed to enter. Entrance. To enter the school of Yale. Did Michelle, Michelle Obama go to Yale? I don't remember. I hope she did. I hope she went there. It has a little picture of her memorial, her Vietnam Veteran Memorial. Her civil, her civil rights memorial is inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. I love Martin Luther King. I love this lady already. Until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness. That's the quote on the memorial. The memorial title... What is missing highlights animal and plant species that have gone extinct and the destruction of habitats throughout the world. I really like this lady. I'm going to hopefully meet her one day. And if I don't, that's fine. I'm totally inspired by this. All right. One more because I need to do some research about these ladies and their art. Because I didn't learn this in art school. What is that about? Yes. Nampeo. What were we talking about? Indigenous people. Alright, let's look at 
her art and on Teo. How beautiful is that? I love it. Okay. On the left side, her work is still sought after and highly prized by collectors. Of course, the people that have money are buying the art that they didn't care about. Oh, wait, that's my opinion. I'm sorry. Ignore that. Help to introduce the world to indigenous ceramics. Indigenous ceramics are great. Very versatile. Um, I, I would love to own one of them or cre replicate one. Um, created a, rena a renaissance in Hopi pottery. So she's Hopi. I don't know much about the Hopi people. I will look it up after this video. When I first began to paint, I used to go to the ancient village and pick up pieces of pottery and copy the designs. That is how I learned to paint. You see, she copied and she learned. You can copy art and learn from it, but you don't want to take credit. Um, you want to make sure you mention that person that you're copying, and then you want to create your own art because it's your creation. But now, I just close my eyes and see designs, and I paint them. Nampeo. And she's not alive anymore. She passed away, which is unfortunate. Nampeo, ceramic artist, 1859. 1942. I need a drink more water. All right. Nampeo was the first internationally known Native American ceramic artist and single-handedly sparked a renaissance in the art form. She was born in 1859 and grew up on ancestral Hopi lands in Arizona. So she is a Hopi Native American which would be the correct term because there are different types of tribes. At the time, the traditional technique of making Hopi pottery was a lost art, and the pots were being made were pots being made were thin and would crack. And you know this, I'm just going to interrupt myself. This is actually really common in uh, Native American culture. They have forgotten a lot of their arts and their traditions um, due to certain reasons which I won't mention but um this is very common and it's very sad for me for everyone because you know it's a beautiful culture anyways before I get emotional Nampeo found shards of old Hopi pottery that had been made 300 years before she was born the designs were geometric and intricate and most important the clay was smooth and strong she studied these shards and figured out how to match the clay and recreate the designs using science the result was pottery that was a beautiful as that was as beautiful as that of her ancestors. Nampeo began teaching her methods to others, and the Hopi revival pottery movement was born. And that's how you do it. You teach others your art, your craft. <coughs> Sorry. Water. <coughs> oh god. Nampeo also used traditional natural dye techniques to paint her pots with colors. I'm going to butcher this word. I have no idea how to say it. Sikyakki. I butchered it. It means yellow house in Hopi and refers to this multicolor ceramic style. Many of the ge geometric designs of Nampeya ceramics are symbolic and sig symbolic of significant stories in Hopi heritage and history. For example, an abstract geometry of birds' wings referenced the migration and movement of the Hopi people to their land. As Nampeo's techniques improved, she began cre uh, to create her own unique designs and patterns, which is awesome. The Santa Fe Railroad expanded to the southwest about the same time the Nampeo was making pottery. Tourists would stop at the tra trading post and purchase indigenous arts and crafts, which was a great source of income for many Native American communities. By age 20, Nampio was, was, Nampio was a well-known ceramicist, and her nor notoriety, oh god, I'm going to have trouble with this word too. Hold on. Sorry, my jaw. Notoriety grew as she traveled the country demonstrating her craft. Many indigenous women were, created, were creating artwork during this time period, but Nampio was the most visible, and her name added extra value for cur curators and collect collectors. Artists such as Nampio and the expansion of transportation in the Southwest helped to spark a new interest in indigenous crafts throughout America and Europe. In old age, Nampio began to lose her eyesight, 
but she continued to work. So yes, we can still make art even if we're blind, deaf, um, mute, missing hands, missing feet. Uh, you know, you can still make art. Her entire family would help paint her ceramics. In 1942, she passed away at the age of 83. That's a good age. And her grandchildren and great-grandchildren continue her poverty dynasty. So, Napia was not alive anymore, but in a sense, she is still alive through her artwork. And you can contact her family. I don't know what her, her native name... Well, actually... You might just be able to look up Nantia and find her whole family. So, um, yeah, look that up. And let's see what we have here. Um, we have a picture of a little pot. And it says, it's of both Tiwa and Hopi descent. Oh, another Africa native uh, tribe. Both of Tiwa and Hopi descent. Both have influenced her pottery. That's very interesting. And now there's a picture of a snake. Oh, she has a Tiwa name. Her Tiwa name means snake that does not bite. I'm going to write that down. Snake that doesn't bite. And then there's a picture of a Hopi village and the canyons, I'm, I'm assuming. She taught classes at the Hopi house at the Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> and there's a little picture of her. She looks really cute with a photographer. She was the most photographed ceramicist in the Southwest in the 1870s, so we can find pictures of her. Um, starting when William Henry Jackson photographed her in 1875. So look up William Henry Jackson if you want to see pictures of Nanteo. And here's a little picture of her in traditional Hopi uh, clothing with her fiancé husband, super cute. Her husband worked on excavations where she may where she may have found the ancient Hopi pottery that inspired her. Oh, that's so cute. That's so nasty. I'm not gonna cry because I have mascara on. Okay, if we're gonna do one more. I'm a little emotional. Alright. <laughs> this is hilarious. Okay, so we have another purple. And this will be the last one. I cannot go through. I cannot go through these emotions. Whew. All right. So it's Hung Liu. She's a painter and installation artist. 1948. So from the left. Oh God. Creates work about forgotten and displaced people in history. Great. I love it. Her style has been called weeping realism. I've never heard of that. That is actually really cool. Hmm. I think I might have that type of style. Uses imagery from old pho photographs to create oil paintings about memory. That's really interesting. And here's her quote. Altogether, I hope to wash my subjects of their exotic otherness and reveal them as dignified even mythical figures on the grander scale of history painting. I am looking from the mythic pose beneath the historic figure and the painting beneath the photograph. Hung Liu. And if I say that wrong, I'm sorry. I am not very good with Mandarin or Cantonese. Not my favorite language because it's, I can't pronounce it correctly. I'm not saying it's not a beautiful language. All right, so... <laughs> Let me drink more water. This is the last one. I will continue reading this book off camera. Hung Liu, Liu was born in the Republic of China in 1948. A year after her birth, the Communist Party of Mao Zedong came to power. And in 1996, the Cultural Revolution began, and the country was purged of any Western or non-conformist influences. Over the next 10 years, more than a million people were displaced, arbitrarily imprisoned, or even executed for expressing ideas that were not in line with Mao. I'm going to take off my glasses for this. So... 
Let's see. During this time, many historic Chinese artifacts and buildings were destroyed in an attempt to rewrite history. Look at that, trying to rewrite history. As usual, everyone tries to do that. Uh, all of these events had a great impact on Hung Liu, who would later create an artwork that looked at the way history plays out and how history is written, written by the winners. Exactly. So history is written by the winners. As part of the Cultural Revolution re-education program, Hung Liu was sent to a small village to work in the rice and wheat fields for four years. In her spare time, she photographed and sketched many of the local farmers. After schools reopened in 1972, Hung Liu uh, studied art at the Beijing Teachers College, where she, tra she trained to paint in the socialist, realist style. Well, it's so good, I don't do that. In 1981, she completed her master's degree in mural painting at the Center Academy of Fine Arts. Her portfolio was accepted and into the graduate program of the University of California. San Diego in 1984 was just $20. She only had $20 and two suitcases. Liu moved to the United States. She only moved here by herself with $20. Oh, look, in 1991, my birth year. Hung Liu took a trip back to China and discovered old photographs of, ch of child street performers, farmers, female laborers, refugees, and others. Inspired by these photos, became the subjects of, of Hung Liang oil paintings. She became known for combining the photos of displaced people with imagery from traditional Chinese paintings. I love traditional Chinese paintings and traditional Japanese paintings. I'm very influenced by Japanese traditional paintings. Like traditional floor and pottery motifs, Liu has created dozens of painting series exploring these themes, including the series called Women at Work. Her paintings are covered with dripping layers of paint, washes, and seed oil to preserve and destroy the image and to give the feel of distant memory. Lindsay oil, I might be allergic to that but that's very interesting. In 2015, Hung Liu had a retrospective called Summoning Ghosts that opened the Museum of California. After seeing it, a critic from the Wall Street Journal called her the greatest Chinese painter in the US. Hung Liu continues to be inspired by photographs and the place of forgotten people. Her work makes the viewer reflective of, on how her memories shape and shared history. So she's still alive. Um, like I said before, if you like her art, contact her, send her art. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing that she's doing. She has twice received National Endowment for the Artist Fellowship, so she's getting money from Artist Fellowships, which is really great. Um, any artist can get that. Um, you know, so try it. Artist Fellowships, they're great. This painting is actually quite sad. It's a mother with her baby. Her series, American Exodus, uses photographs taken by Sophia Lange of the Dust Bowl. So we talked about her earlier, I think. Anyways. Professor Emerita of painting at Mills College in Oakland, California, where she taught from 1990 to 2014. It's just a picture of... Um, Professor Marita, you know, it's just a little picture of her. And I assume this is a picture of Hung, Hung Liu. She also uses photographs from her own life, like in her self-portrait painting cut out called Avant-Garde, 1993. Uh, and it's a picture of her. I think she has a gun, maybe when she served in the military, if she served in the military. And here's another painting. Oh, no, sorry, this is an installation, which is a physical piece. She also created installation art such as Jujin Shan. Jujin Shan, I can say that. Old Gold Mountain, 1994. A mound of 200,000 fortune cookies on top of train tracks. Ooh, that's, that's intense. I love that. Yeah, so... Hong Liu. Still alive, still doing art.
making a difference in this world. All these ladies are making a difference in this world, you know, um, and they're artists. And I, I'll let you decide what you, um, what you think about art. Um, I'll tell you what I think about artists, any artists. We're the most powerful people in the world. And a lot of people will say, oh, art is useless. Art is, art is nothing. Um, that isn't true. Um, without art, you won't have anything uh, because everything is designed by artists. Um, that table that you're sitting at, the computer that you're sitting at is designed by an artist. Your house, um, everything, everything is designed by an artist or an inventor. So, you know, don't believe what people say about artists. Art is not useless. Um, art is creation. So, yeah. Sorry, my roommate was um, So yeah, that, that's it for Women in Art um, by the book. It is so good. It is so good. I love it. Buy the book. Read it with your kids. Read it to yourself. Make notes. You know, create art. Do you. And next Friday, um, we will continue um, The Princess Diana. The Princess Diana stuff, because we really want to finish that. And I think we're going to use her style, maybe? I don't know. We'll leave it up to whatever happens. I don't like making guidelines. We just we just make art. So enjoy your Friday. Um, I hope you are inspired and you learn something new. I learned a lot of new things. Yeah. I'm probably going to go and cry a little bit. <laughs> it was very emotional for me. But yeah, so um, enjoy your Friday and make sure you you uh, read and make some art.